we know that we've decreased fatalities in the Mid-Atlantic region uh, quite effectively. Next slide, Landy, please. So this is just a, a, a little bit redundant, but again, over the last 12 years, we've really substantially decreased the number of equine fatalities in the Mid-Atlantic region. And we did that using evidence-based risk management, okay? We also, all of this work was based upon subjective data. What that means is when we examine horses before a race, when we examine them after a race, when we um, look at uh, horses on the vets list, or why do they, how do they go on the vets list? How do they get off the vets list? All of these uh, tools that we use for evaluating lameness in horses or unsoundness is subjective data. These are physical examinations by human beings. And if you got three or four veterinarians to look at almost any given horse, not in a really extreme case, but a lot of the horses are only mildly lame. Some of them would say the horse is lame. Some of them would say the horse is not lame. When we do a test in New York, when the horses come to the test barn after a claiming race, I can tell you that it's not infrequent that there'll be some discussion about is that horse lame or is that horse not lame? So subjective data is great. And, you know, it's very useful, particularly in, in uh, you know, basically fairly obvious situations. We talk about the AP lameness grading scale, you know, uh, grade two or more, you get pretty obvious, but the grade ones and grades two, you know, are, are kind of hard to pick apart. And so those are great tools, but they are subjective. Let's move on, Andy. So the, the, I, th I believe that the way forward for us to actually do better in reducing fatalities is really early recognition of horses that are unsound before they are so obvious that we can see them on a subjective lameness exam. We need objective data to do that. So I think that the other thing, you know that there, there's millions of dollars being spent around the country right now looking at novel imaging technology, PET scans in particular, and CAT scans and the combination of the two. And these are terrific, terrific diagnostic tools. They are, are pretty, they're pretty poor scanning tools. You know, we talk about using the scanning tools or, or you know, screening tools, but they're really not that great for that, not because they're not accurate. A good screening tool has got to be affordable, readily available, and accurate. And CAT scans and PET scans are absolutely accurate. They're the best we've got, but they are not readily affordable and they're not readily available. You know, they're not scalable. You know, you can't put a CAT, you can't say I'm going to CAT scan every horse that races. We need technology that we can put on every horse that races and be able to get some information from that device that'll help steer us, find out which horses need to be PET scanned, which horses need a CAT scan. I want you to think about this as kind of like a mammography stepwise process where there's mammography screening that then leads to other diagnostic tests. We don't do biopsies in every woman that goes in to see if they got a breast tumor. That's ridiculous. And uh, so the same thing applies here that we need a screening device to get us to the imaging in an efficient way to do that. Next slide, please, Andy. So this is a group of people that's worked on this for a long time, not me. I'm late to the party. I've only been working on this for about a year now, but uh, it's a group of people that's done a lot of work on horses' gait analysis using some very sophisticated technology. Next slide, please. Biometrics devices, these are Fitbits, basically. You know, what it is is a very sophisticated device that tells us a lot about horses' gait that is impossible to see by any other means. Next slide, please. This is the size of a small cell phone and it fits in the saddle cloth of the racehorse. There are no wires attached to the horse. This is slipped right into the saddle cloth, just like the Trachis device. The Trachis device is a the device that, that gives you a, a, an idea about where the horse is on the racetrack and you see them on the tote boards, there's little chiclets on the bottom of the screen. Uh, all of the devices that are used right now it, are accurate to about one meter uh, in terms of their, their accuracy. This device is accurate to 10 centimeters. That's a huge difference. In other words, this, the, this, uh, uh, these sensors will transmit to a satellite. We know where that sensor is. We know where that little device is within 10 centimeters, up, down, left to right, side to side, going front to back. So it measures acceleration, not speed. Acceleration is a change in speed. So it measures changes in speed, either in the longitudinal front to back direction or the up and down direction, that's vertical or medial to lateral, that's side to side. And it does that 800 times a second. And all that data is transmitted to a satellite, downloaded to a computer, and then we get a readout from that. Next slide, please. 
So I want you to think about the equine gallop in a little bit different way. We've all seen slow motion pictures of horses racing and galloping. And it's a beautiful thing to watch and it sure looks complicated because it's, it's sometimes you got one foot on the ground, sometimes you got three feet on the ground, sometimes you got no feet on the ground. And I, what I like about this program is that this algorithm breaks the gallop down into three phases. The first phase of the stride is the hind limb stance phase. That's when either one or two hind limbs are loaded. And think of these hind limbs as gigantic springs. So we're gonna load those springs during the stance phase. The horse's hips are gonna drop down a little bit, compress, and then what happens? During the second phase of the stride, the horse is, is uh, drop, driving forward and landing on the forelimbs. That's called the forelimb stage, uh, stance phase. And that's when you catch the weight of the horse, throwing it forward off the springs, you catch it on the front legs. The third final phase of the stride is the period of suspension. That's where the horse takes a breath. And this is important. This is where that horse adjusts their body in the air to optimize landing for the next stride. Now, if everything's all well and good, they don't do much adjusting, but they can't adjust their, their body once it's on the ground. They can't change the load once it's on the ground, but they can, while they're in the air, move their axial skeleton in such a way that they can maybe go a little bit lighter on that landing or switch a lead or whatever to help reduce pain that might be related to a subclinical lameness. Next slide, please. So I just want you to look on the left-hand side here, we see the three vectors here. We have longitudinal, and we have vertical, and we have side-to-side, uh, -side, medial lateral. And notice that during the hind limb stance phase, as you can see here with the horse uh, coming down the stretch at Belmont, we've got a fairly uh, synchro synchronized uh, graph here of the different acceleration phases. And now let's have the next slide, please. This is the forelimb stance phase. This is the landing, catching all that weight from the hind end. And you can see things are very different here than they were in the loading phase. And let's, let's go to the last phase, please, Andy. Next line. And this is the period of suspension when the horse is in, in the air. Now look at how synchronized all these vectors are when the horse is flying through the air. So they're very different. But anyway, the computer looks at all these peaks and knows where they're supposed to be and knows what the amplitudes are supposed to look like and knows what the relationships are. Next slide, please. So we get a computer report that either says green, red, or yellow. And the green alert means that the horse is basically uh, consistent, that, that stride and that pattern is consistent with elite sound racehorses for the most part. And we can also, as we get data on more horses, we can compare an individual horse to his previous races, which is the best baseline. The yellow alert is when you have a, a standard, more than a standard deviation of two from the, from the baseline. And a red alert is a horse that has a standard deviation of at least three from the baseline. Now, anything in science, if it's three standard deviations away from the average, it's so far off the scale that there's no possible way that could be attributed to a random event. Next slide, please. So this is what these things look like. Uh, basically, the solid green line here is the uh, total power of the race. Now this is smooth data, it's, you don't have a point here for, you don't have 800 points here per second, they average it over 10 seconds so you can actually see a line instead of a, a crazy amount of up and down displacement. So you've got this green, solid green line, the one standard deviation above and below is the dotted green line. Seconds is, is the uh, baseline, this is throughout a race. Next one please, Andy. Now this is the same horse, we've got a baseline, we've got a green, um, you know, line here, we got a yellow line. Now you can see the yellow line is slightly above the uh, one standard deviation from the baseline. So this is a horse that is not exactly normal, but eh, it's worth looking at this horse, but not, nothing too serious going on here at this point. Next slide, Andy. Now this is an, another race where the horse has got a red flag alert and this horse is way off the line. There's, he's very far outside of the normal range. And this is a horse, that deserves some veter immediate veterinary scrutiny. Next slide, please, Andy. So these individual charts where we measure total power, that's the amount of energy that the horse is putting into the race. How much effort is the horse putting forward? Vibration, that's the concussion the horse is experiencing the, in the race. That's the, the, what's the, the penalty they pay for the power. The more power, the more concussion, the more vibration. Dorsoventral charts show the up and down movement of the horse. If a horse's springs in the back, are not working properly, then there is very little up and down acceleration. That's a problem. And you can see that on these, these horses by looking at that. 
longitudinal just changes in forward acceleration, the most important thing here is that we can see horses that are moving forward in the race, and we can see horses that are decelerating, especially rapidly if something happens. Medial to lateral is the balance from left to right. Next slide, please, Andy. I wanna share with you an interesting case study of a horse at Saratoga this summer. And um, what you see here is that this was the beginning of the study and we did not have enough data to have a real big population number to look as, as a baseline. So what you're seeing here is a, the blue line and the dotted lines is the uh, initial number of horses that we had to work with were pretty small. So it's a pretty wide standard deviation relative to the baseline, but, but you can see the horse uh, in this particular race, this was a six and a half furlong race. It was a, a grade two race at Saratoga. And the horse was fairly well in the normal range for total power and total vibration. Nothing too exciting here. Next slide, please, Andy. The dorsal ventral, notice in the dorsal ventral graph though, this horse was way below the mean from the, throughout the whole race. And in particular, between 50 and 60 seconds, this horse was way below. You know, uh, that something is particularly going on there. The longitudinal uh, acceleration, if you look at this one, look at it about uh, accelerating pretty aggressively up until around 58 seconds, then the horse rapidly decelerates from around 58 to 62 seconds. And if we go over and look at the medial to lateral forces, we can see this horse was never in the baseline really, and had two major events where the horse was way out of balance. And one of them was a, somewhere around 35 to 40 seconds, and then a real big one at what, around 58. So look at that, that 58 second period, or the 55 to 58 second period, something seriously wrong was going on here. Now this horse, I wanna emphasize this horse, finished the race in second place by a head. The jockey was ecstatic, thought it was a great race. The trainer was ecstatic, thought it was a great race. But, you know, they, 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 they didn't have access to this information. Nobody did. And we didn't, even at the time, have that information. So this horse goes back to the test barn. It walks about a quarter mile from the unsaddling area back to the test barn for blood tests after the race and blood and urine. So when it gets back there, as it's cooling out, the horse starts to become lame. The horse was so lame in the test barn, it had to be set, vanned back to its stable to be examined by a veterinarian. When it got back there, the, the horse was very lame, they, ex they examined, next slide please, Andy. And they radiographed it, and this horse had, in that race, developed an acute sagittal fracture of the right third carpal bone. Now this, we, we know, and we know exactly when this happened, and it's only because that technology can see things that nobody else can see. And it's, it's just r really remarkable. Next slide, please, Andy. So that's, that's a, an anecdotal comment. That's a single horse, and we don't make decisions based on anecdotal information. And repeated anecdotal incidents is not, is not a controlled study. So we needed to look at this a little bit in depth to figure out what was going on. The first question really was, uh, can we use this technology in a very high tempo racetrack? And is it gonna be disruptive? I mean, can we get these sensors into the saddle cloths? Can we download the data? Can we, can we get good information? We can, can we make decisions based on that? And we found a couple of things. First of all, we were able to get data. Uh, we were able to put these sensors in the saddle cloths and it, we got good information. Um, we also found that we were able to get a very good tight fingerprint of the Saratoga main track, the dirt track. That's because we had uh, 200, more than 250 horses run over it and we could see a fingerprint for that racetrack. Very important because we can not only use this data to identify horses at risk of injury, we can also use it to figure out if there's any problems on the racetrack because frankly, the, where a horse really gets injured on a racetrack is not usually where they come up on the uh, charts. You know, a horse pulls up at the eighth pole. That's not typically where he gets injured. He's injured a long time before that. Depends on how long it takes to pull him up or he'll decelerate, whatever. But this tells us uh, if there is a problem in the racetrack, we know we're looking at the right part of the racetrack. Uh, in this group of horses, there were 3% of them had a red alert. And in some cases, it correlated with pre-race inspection abnormal findings and or high-speed exercise anomalies that uh, I could identify with an algorithm that we use with the jockey club to examine their exercise history and data. Um, we certainly felt like though we needed to answer a couple of questions like what are we really measuring here? And also, um, can we get a series of individual fingerprints from horses and fine tooth the alert sensitivity and specificity? Next slide, Andy. So this to my knowledge is the first time that biometric sensors have ever been looked at in a prospective and longitudinal fashion to find out 
um, what are we measuring? Okay, so we know that from, from analyzing this data that, that there was a, a very significant difference between the horses that had these different categorizations, red, yellow, or green. We also use this Fisher exact test of independence is used to compare proportions of populations, to means of proportions of population to see if there's a difference. So for example, what we found here is we, one of our outcome, there are seven outcome criteria we looked at, this is only one, but it's an important one. This is in a, we looked at these horse, followed them for four months after the Saratoga races and said, basically asked the question, did these horses come back and race again within four months? Now, the first time this technology was ever used was in, New York, in uh, Washington State at uh, Emerald Downs Racetrack. And, the, and I had the data from Emerald Downs and, and looked at that, but the challenge was that Emerald Downs shuts down and at that point, nothing happens there for six months. So everybody, all the, all the horses got six months off. Well, at Saratoga, at the end of the Saratoga meet on Labor Day, these horses don't go on vacation. They usually go on and do something else. And they, they may not be all going to the Breeders' Cup, but they're going on to race or do something. And so what we did, we looked at whether or not these horses were able to come back and race again within four months of leaving the Saratoga uh, meet. What we found was that the, the red horses, horses with red alerts, only 40% of them were able to come back and race within four months. The yellow horses, 72% came back and raced within four months. The green horses, 78% came back and raced within four months. An enormous significant difference between the green and the red. Now the yellow and the green are not significantly different, but, but we can say categorically, horses with red alerts are, not gonna, are very likely not to come back and race for four months after they get that red alert. And that's, that's the first time we've ever seen, been able to get data like this that really shows that we are measuring something very significant. Now one might argue, that well, horses can, can be out of training for a couple of different reasons. It's not always because they're lame, but let's, let's think about that for a second. Next slide, please, Andy. So uh, this, this, we know that, that most of these red horses didn't make it back to race for four months. We know that pre-existing musculoskeletal abnormalities are found in most horses with catastrophic injuries. We also know that lameness is an overt gait abnormality and is the number one cause of attrition in thoroughbred racehorses. And what we can conclude from all this is that these wearable sensors are able to detect subtle gait abnormalities, parentheses, early signs of lameness before overt clinical signs are apparent. That is huge. Next slide, please, Andy. So then we, from there, we went down to Belmont. And at this point, we measured, we were only able to measure one race a day at Saratoga. We measured every horse in every race at the Belmont Fall Meet and the Aqueduct Winter Meet. At this point, we've got thousands of horses to look at. We have good data on multiple racetracks. We've got good data on, on horses that we've got multiple races on them to track them over time and see what happens to them. And we've been able to refine the algorithms to make them more sensitive and more specific. Next slide, please. This is an example of a horse from the Belmont Fall Meet. And the red line on the bottom is a race that took place on the 30th of October in 2021. And the other races that are above that, the other different colors are pre just previous races. You can see there's a fair amount of consistency in dorsal ventral forces. Uh, there's a little bit more differences in the, in the longitudinal forces, medial lateral, there's a lot going on there, but, but notice how different this red race was. And so this gives you an example of how you can take the, a current race and compare it with a history of previous races, okay? And it's really important to be able to do that because this is that horse's individual baseline, his fingerprint, if you will, of what he looks like when he's going fast. And so um, this particular horse, I called the trainer and I said to him, I said, you know, we've got a, a red alert on your horse the other day. And I said, I, I really feel obliged to, to let you know about that because horses that get red alerts generally don't come back and do well for a while. And, and often as a uh, reason is that is unsoundness. I said, have you had any unsoundness with this horse? And he said, well, not really, Doc. He said, he said, not that I could tell, but he's a pretty lousy racehorse. <laughs> he seemed, seemed to be getting worse over time. So this last race that he had was just terrible. And you can see he's underpowered in, in all areas. So he's not going fast. He's not pushing off his springs. And his medial lateral forces, while they're fairly uniform, are consistently displaced one side against the other. So this is a horse that may, may just be a little bit off, but basically he's not a very talented horse either. He's either not trying or he's not protecting himself. So it's, a, it's an example of how, this is why we need to be very uh, specific about what we're measuring. And uh, it's important that we re continue to refine this 
program to make it better and better as time goes on. Next slide, please. So conclusion, bottom line, this technology has great promise to provide a practical and scalable screening tool to detect subtle gait abnormalities before the overt clinical signs of lameness are evident. Early diagnosis and timely intervention can help keep these horses in training in a safe manner and prevent career ending or catastrophic injury. Another really important thing I wanna point out here is that the uh, relationship between a regulatory veterinarian and a trainer is generally adversarial. And that's because we're working at the far end of the scale. By the time the adversarial situation comes because the trainer puts a horse in to run and a regulatory veterinarian looks at it and says, not today. That's a problem for both people, okay? This technology gives us the opportunity to start a conversation way before things get to that level and gives us the opportunity to intervene in a positive way. It makes it, makes it a team effort between regulatory veterinarians and trainers and, and attending veterinarians so we can all work together to help these horses get squared away um, before they get seriously injured. And, it, and it, I'm confident that when we get this used in widespread use, it's going to give us more horses in the starting gate. It's going to improve our, our ability to uh, prevent catastrophic injury. And it'll help, it'll help our industry in general be more economic, economically sufficient. Next slide, Andy, please. So as, as late as March 25th in 2021 in the Mid-Atlantic region, the Philadelphia Inquirer had a, a terrible article on their uh, slamming horse racing. But talking about the killing is built into the system. Now we know that, that it isn't built into the system. We know that because for the last uh, you know, 10 years, we've been able to reduce the fatality rate by almost 40% because there's stuff that we can do. And if we can do that better, we're gonna do better. But this gives us the potential to take this all to a whole nother level. I think if, if uh, let's next slide, please, Andy. Instead of talking about the killing fields, it gives us the opportunity to say things like, thoroughbred horse racing is now using state-of-the-art biometric sensor technology to take horse and rider safety to the next level. That's the truth. And it also changes the narrative. I'm sure many of you watched some playoff football games in the NFL this past fall. I couldn't watch a single playoff game without a commercial in there by the NFL talking about all the great work they're doing and, and with biometric sensors and research and concussion management and concussion protocols. We can do the same thing with horse racing, and that's an invaluable asset. 